play. What does play have to do with working on our creativity? I, and I try to explain gently that we have an expression, the play of ideas. Uh, and we don't realize that it's actually a prescription. Play, and you will have ideas. Julia, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for being a guest again. You're very welcome. You're on the show today. Not only are you a living legend and, and the artist way, which is your, I would say, magnum opus has changed the lives of millions of creators and entrepreneurs all over the world. Uh, it was very instrumental in helping me. Uh, I still take a lot of the same. I, I take a lot of the exercises from what I learned from your original book. Uh, and so I want to start off by saying thank you. And we're here today to discuss what I would just call an extension of that work uh, with a, a new book titled Living the Artist's Way. But these are my words. I'm hoping that you can you know, welcome us and put us with your words. Tell us a little bit about this new work as it relates to past work and what we have to be excited about. Okay. Well, I would I would say that the original Artist's Way was essentially a toolkit you went week to week, tool to tool, uh, and uh, if you followed through with everything, you would have a creative breakthrough. Now, living the artist's way is a diary rather than a toolkit. Uh, it's a chance for people to follow my lead and I try to lead by example uh, and I show how I use guidance uh, in every corner of my life uh, and the original artist way I, which was published in 1992 I said try asking for written guidance uh, and I gave directions uh, and just sort of assumed that people would would try the tool of guidance. So then I went 30 years without mentioning guidance <laughs> yet. Uh, and uh, it was something that I... Um, I used pretty much daily, uh, and I found myself saying, oh, maybe it's time to come out of the closet. <laughs> uh, and I, I say that phrase, in the closet, uh, because I think I was afraid uh, to talk about guidance for fear I would sound too woo-woo. <laughs> <laughs> and that people would find me, oh, just a little bit cracked. Uh, and uh, it, it took 30 years for me to get the courage to say, well, I use guidance. It's a regular tool. Uh, and uh, I'm going to now try to talk about it. Uh, and so that's what the book is. It's talking about guidance. It's showing you examples of using guidance. Uh, and uh, maybe we should define guidance. There you go. Uh, I would say guidance is information that comes to us from what seems to be a higher source. What about the word guidance as it relates to how most people experience it on a regular basis like they get career guidance you know from their career counselors when they're in high school and college or we get you know guidance uh from our therapist it doesn't seem to me that those things are higher higher powers so would you specifically exclude those things in the way that you think about guidance and would you you know when you talk about a higher power um maybe you can you know, be a little bit more clear about that for us. 
Okay, so uh, I would tend to exclude human guidance from my definition of guidance. Uh, and I found that by writing for guidance and asking the question, what about X? Uh, and then listening, I would hear feedback. Mm. And I think... I think uh, that this is where people are needing to go now. Uh, and uh, so they write for guidance, listen for an answer, and write down the answer. It's a very simple but effective formula. Again, I was lucky enough to get an early copy of the book. The book is out. Now, um, so again, congratulations. There are some aspects of um, writing that you have been advocating for that are are very similar to um, some other prescriptions that you have given to the worldwide creative community in years past between your original work in 92 there and where we are now, but there's some similarities too. I'm wondering so that you know people who are listening or watching right now uh that i what's the difference for example between morning pages what you you know to me that is a thing that has stuck with me for years just writing you know just whatever comes to mind uh first thing in the morning as it's sort of dumping ground for ideas it clarifies the mind it gives me a bunch of things that i you know have to think about later and it's just been very very valuable how do you see, or what could you explain to a listener who might not have the book in front of them right now? How should they think about what, you know, writing for guidance? How is it different from, say, morning pages? Okay. So this is a good question. Uh, morning pages are three pages of longhand morning writing about absolutely anything. Uh, and you're sort of sending a telegram to the universe, and you're saying, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, this is what I want more of, this is what I want less of. And it's as if you have a little uh, whisk broom, and you're sort of poking it into all the corners of your life, and you're sweeping the debris into the center of the room, uh, where it can be dealt with. So uh, morning pages, you you do find you get guidance from morning pages, but it's seldom as specific as the guidance that you get when you ask a direct question. Mm. So morning pages are meanderings uh, and guidance our specificity great distinction great distinction that makes me want to refer to the text again i have it open here in front of me um to that point there is a theme there is a uh, uh, a reoccurrence of the word inviting this is what each of the weeks of your six-week program here um this is how you've framed them up. Week one, for example, is inviting grounding. Others are inviting strength, calm, inviting optimism, etc. Why did you choose the word inviting? Well, I, I think it's because I wanted it to be a pleasant process. Uh, mm -hmm. And we think of an invitation uh, as a, a pleasantry. A, a feeling of, oh, <laughs> maybe kindness. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and so I said we invite uh, because we are moving forward uh, with a sense of optimism. Mm. Uh, and it's a d very different feeling to say that something is inviting a sense of calm rather than to say and now demanding a <laughs> there's a certain a gentleness almost as well isn't there 
Yes. Hopefully this book is very gentle uh, and very, I hope, persuasive. Uh, and I, I feel like I, I am vulnerable in this book. I, I talk about what I'm afraid of. I talk about what I have hopes about. Uh, and um, I think I, I try to lead by example. Oh, you have done that masterfully. Um, and I wanted to ask you about a couple of those things specifically. But before we do, um, again, I've got some notes here in front of me. I can't go too far past this idea of asking very specific questions, because that, as you mentioned, is a differentiation from a lot of your previous work, your most famous work being, again, for me, especially, I will say the the morning pages. And and you mentioned that, you know, looking for guidance on very specific questions, how it has a different sort of power. It delivers a different kind of answer than some of the more sweep it in the middle of the room sort of analogy that you gave. I'm wondering, since, uh, you know, it would be an absolute pleasure for me to go question by question here in, in, in the book, but given that we are... Um, you know, that the goal here is to give people who are listening just a, a, a dose of inspiration and a primer for the book. What do you feel like are some of the most popular and or most important questions that people should ask when they're asking for guidance from the universe? Well, I think that the dominant question is, what do I do about X? And then you list... Uh, an issue that's particularly pressing. So X may vary from person to person. Uh, and uh, then I find that the next most asked question is, oh my God, what do I do next? <laughs> then you're asking for direct guidance on your next step. Uh, and um, what do I do next? And what about X? Are the are the two most primary questions? Hmm. There's a bit um, somewhere in the middle of the book that um, when you talk about you know choosing an area of your life where you're where you're struggling to have you know say patience for example. I was in in intrigued by the fact that you were asking about acceptance and grief some of these things that are not i don't know maybe it's just because they're not flashy or catchy or they're things that are um that feel vulnerable and historically our culture has not has not been that we're getting better thanks in large part to your work and other work from friends like Brene brown and, and, and others but i'm curious why are you asking the questions about grieving and about accepting? Well, I, I think it's because these are the areas where we have the most difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're sort of taboo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we ask, what should I do about grief? Well, I'll give you an, ex an example. Um, I got divorced from my first husband 45 years ago. Was that was that Marty? Yes. Okay, Marty Scorsese. Uh, and 45 years later, I realized that I still loved him. Okay. And <laughs> wow, love it. I was troubled by this. Uh, and I went to guidance and said, what should I do about loving Marty? Uh, it seems awfully codependent of me. 45 years later, surely I should have been over it by now. Uh, and the guidance replied, love is eternal. Wow. 
and and so it was directing me to sort of drop the rock to to stop worrying about loving uh, and just love allow right uh, so that was an answer that dealt with grief uh, and um, and with acceptance with both things are there do you feel like the, asking those questions in that particular order is is that some sort of a one two i won't say punch cuz punch is too violent is that just, it, but it's like there's so much value it feels like in asking those two questions about grie you know grieving and acceptance grieving and acceptance do you find them to be you know, especially to create an, a special amount of leverage for good, or is that just? Am I reading too much into that? No, or is that I by think, design. I think you're being very accurate. Hmm. Uh, I, I think uh, I think those questions do create leverage, uh, and they leverage our soul into a more loving space mm -hmm. what role do things like that have to do with creativity what what role do things like love and acceptance and forgiveness um notice there are you know just the, the book is and all of your work is but these are just overwhelmingly positive even the concept of grief and asking about it somehow um it's like a ninja move <laughs> for our mind what role in your in your eyes what value do does does asking those sorts of questions have on on our our natural creativity do you have something in mind when you're designing these questions or is this a fundamental truth that you've come to know? What role does knowing those things have to do with being a, a good artist? Well, I think uh, when you say being a good artist, you're talking essentially about openness. Uh, and you're talking about feeling uh, connected to all the different parts of yourself. Uh, and I think when you are asking those questions, you're saying, okay, I'm ready. Tell me what I need to know. Uh, and the answers to the questions give you a, a platform on, on which to stand uh, when you make your art. Mm. Mm. Let's return, if we will, to the concept of gentle. It was that came up when we were talking about inviting things. There's a kindness you said, and it felt like you know, we, we arrived, I think, together through a little discourse at sort of there's a gentleness. It's present in all of your work. It's specifically you know, present in, you know, it, it shows up a lot and I'm, it just made an Im impression on me again here. I'm looking at page 113, guided to self-forgiveness and it says, your need is gentleness. The guidance read right tonight on self-forgiveness, you will be led. Let's talk specifically about gentleness. Why that? Well, I think why gentleness uh, is because we have many uh, cues in our culture about being harsh. Mm. Our, our culture tells us uh, that we should push, uh, that we should be um, almost punitive. Uh, and I think when we say no, on the contrary, 
try being gentle, we are opening an inner door. Mm. Uh, the inner inner door leads to a pathway, uh, and the the pathway is one that guidance talks about often. Uh, when you go to guidance and you say, what about X? You may hear often the response, all is well. And <laughs> you think, all is well, are you crazy? <laughs> uh, and then you ask again and you hear, all is well. Uh, and eventually you come to believe that all is well. And that's a very gentle dictum. Mm. Well, I like the idea of a dictum. I think that's a great word. Uh, I'm going to, um, what would we call, digress just a little bit here. I want to tell two stories that, that tie to gentleness in my specific question. So um, in reverse chronological order for me, I was just moments ago before we started uh, our call, our our remote recording session here i was on the phone with a dear friend of mine his name is brandon stanton and he uh operates under the artist's moniker uh humans of new york he's written several books and he interviews people on the streets and photographs them and he is he's one of the best writers i know it's a beautiful project if you're not familiar with it you should be he said to say hi to you if separate this is an aside but he said tell julia that i've read the artist way when i was a young young man which had a transformative effect and is part of why he is the person that he is today so note from brendan but what one of the things we were talking about was um you know we both adapted or adopted a few um new year's resolutions and we were checking in on those one another almost like an accountability friend like how's it going and we both cited um the sort of critical inner voice you've written about that critical inner voice before and it, what it feels like is anything but gentle mm -hmm. okay so that's that's part one of my two-part story the other part is another dear friend of mine named his guy named tim ferris who also has one of the world's most popular podcasts he's a lovely lovely human and a great friend and we also were speaking we were speaking uh, recently about how many of us think that our edge, this particular grittiness about us or whatever, that is the thing that makes all of this hard work that we do possible. It's what fuels us and that is the differentiator and why we've been able to accomplish, succeed, be fulfilled or whatever the thing is. It's the edge. So in both of these conversations, I'm using as examples here, there is almost the opposite of gentleness. There's a, almost a berating, like a toughness, a need for a rigidity and discipline and all these words that on the surface don't sound that bad. They sound like they help us. I'm wondering, long question, I'm wondering, how do we reconcile these things? Is it true that these these critical voices and this sort of uh this disciplinarian that lives in our head is it true that they do not help us or do they help us in a certain way and how do you reconcile that with your absolute gentleness your kindness you have this softness about you in person the books here on this call it's all so kind and heartfelt and earnest and generous reconcile those two things for me well, first of all, I think we all have an inner critic uh, that you're talking about, a, a harsh voice uh, that says things like, you must have discipline. And I have an inner voice. Uh, I call him Nigel. Yes, I remember Nigel well, yes. Nigel uh, is always saying hurtful things to me. Nigel says, oh, Julia, you're boring. Or, oh, Julia, you're repetitive. Or, oh, Julia, 
uh, fill in the blank. <laughs> and uh, I have learned over the years that Nigel backs down if you confront him. Mm -hmm. uh, that what we do with this critical inner voice is we need to not believe it, but to disbelieve it. Uh, and to to say to the inner voice, thank you for sharing. <laughs> but I'm going to keep right on writing as I have been writing. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, that the critical voice backs down. Uh, and I, I think, uh, I think we have a, a, a belief system that says we must be edgy. Uh, and uh, again, this is something that you find with experience, you do better coaxing yourself forward uh, than flogging yourself forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think it takes experience to stand up to these voices. Uh, and uh, I think it's quite possible to do it. Does the, the warmth and the gentleness, the kindness, does that lay some sort of a more fertile foundation for it? Or is this just you as a person? Or do you feel like it's actually very helpful for the creative process? Oh, I think it's very helpful for the creative process. Say I more. It, yeah, say more about that. I think it's pivotal. Mm. Uh, I think uh, that when we are confronted with harsh voices, uh, we need to answer the voices with the sense of, positivity we say well thank you for sharing but i'm going to continue uh, and we then continue uh, and uh, i think that what happens when we buy into the harsh voices uh, is that we are sort of s struck mute Hmm. What do you think keeps most people from being the best versions of themselves? Is it our outer cultural trappings? Is it is it their version or our version of Nigel? Is it a lack of raw skill, talent, or dedication, or application of effort? Like what, you know, for most people who are listening, I, I, I will say everyone, but I can't be sure. So I'll say most. There's a gap between where we are and where we want to be. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like are, are some of the most important things or maybe the one thing or a few things? What are your thoughts on what's, what's keeping us from closing that gap? What's keeping us from between where we are and where we want to be for most? artists, most creatives who are, are paying attention to your work, for example, the people who, who read and buy your books? Well, I think, I think what you're talking about in a fancy dress is actually fear. Mm. I think that we are af afraid to be our larger selves. Uh, and I think we have a culture that says, who do you think you are? Don't you think you're getting a little too big for your britches? Uh, and uh, the, the fear of looking foolish, of looking ridiculous, uh, is, a, is a fear that attacks most of us. Uh, and I think that when we confront the fear uh, and uh, when we say, 
I'm going to do this anyway, we begin to become larger. Mm. I, I think it's time to talk about a second tool. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about morning pages, uh, and that's a tool that takes work and discipline. But there's a second tool, which is called an artist's date. I love the artist's dates. Uh, and that's a festive solo expedition to do something fun or interesting. Uh, and uh, it's a gentle tool. But what I find when I teach is that when I assign morning pages, people leap to them. <laughs> They're like, oh, work. I understand working on my creativity. But then if I say, now I'm going to give you another tool, uh, and this tool I would like you to use to play, they get very defensive and they cross their arms skeptically uh, and they say, play. What does play have to do with working on our creativity? Uh, and I try to explain gently that we have an expression, the play of ideas. Uh, and we don't realize that it's actually a prescription. Play, and you will have ideas. Play, uh, yeah, I've been writing about it a lot personally lately because I believe that we've got a culture that is work-obsessed. I have found myself work-obsessed, and it positions play as something, to, the world, rather, positions play as something to do after the work is done. And yet, as you point out with the fact that it's a tool, um, and a tool to unlock and you know get at some of the most important creative material that's inside us do you feel like what do you feel like the relationship between play and work is maybe that's a better question well the relationship between play and work is that they should go hand in glove mm. that we work but then we also play. Uh, and when we play, we unlock. Again, I'm bringing up an inner door. Mm -hmm. The inner door is a door th through which steps uh, what I would call an inner youngster. Uh, and that we are able to, here's the word again, invite the inner youngster to have a say in what we do. Mm. Uh, and ordinarily, we just are listening to our workaholic self. Yeah. We're not listening to the part of ourselves which says, oh, <laughs> I want to play. What role does surrendering play in all of this here in your work? You write about it a lot in, in this book, Living the Artist's Way. Surrendering control, for example. What role does the surrender play for us? Well, I think uh, that when you talk about control, you're talking about what you might call an anti-surrender. <laughs> and uh, it's become something uh, that you force an issue with. Uh, and when you surrender, you're letting go. Uh, and uh, in 12-step jargon, they would say, let go and let God. Uh, and uh, so the, the surrender is a spiritual act. Mm. 
where you you say to yourself, I'm not going to force this. I'm going to invite this. And then you surrender. And what you're surrendering is your sense of control. Your, your sense that you can force an issue. I'm taking some notes here because I feel very, uh, very lucky to get to be with you and ask you anything. <laughs> um, of course, the conversation is, the goal of it is to help a lot of people understand your work, be inspired by it, you know, participate in it, you know, keep picking up the book and whatnot. But I feel compelled to go back to the beginning. And at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about vulnerability. I shared with you that I'm doing a bunch of writing. I, I just mentioned the play part. I'm talking to some other friends about this harsh, hard, sort of hard voice. And it's here in the new year. Your book has just dropped. It's sort of a new year, new use. There's a lot of reflection going on. What do you, you know, you are especially vulnerable in this book by your own admission at the beginning. What do you think you're vulnerable about? And I'd like you to talk a little bit more about it because to me, this is where we all could use a lot of work. Well, I think uh, that when I say I'm more vulnerable, I mean that I'm stepping off of the accepted rational pathway. Uh, and I'm saying, I want you to try something that you have no rational proof about. Uh, something that is an intuitive path. Uh, and uh, I think that when I say I'm going to tell you something from my intuition, uh, I'm telling you something that there's no proof of. Uh, and that when there's no proof, uh, you're stepping into vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So as, as to whether or not uh, it's the voice of your inner child, uh, I think we're all kind of sick of talking <laughs> about inner child. Uh, but I do think that the part of us which creates is youthful. Childlike, I guess. Youthful. What was the hardest part for you in this process of writing this book, Living the Artist's Way? What was, on your creative process particularly, what was difficult? Well, I I talk a, at some length about being worried about the reception of a book of mine. Uh, and uh, I thought, oh, dear God, if I'm talking about worrying about the reception from a book, uh, that's not a worry that most people can readily identify with. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yet it was my truth that I wrote a book, gave it to my publisher, uh, and then waited on pins and needles for his response. Uh, and my guidance had said to me, the book will be received with open arms. Uh, and I found myself doubting my guidance uh, and saying, that's too good to be true. <laughs> uh, and so people will ask me, do you ever doubt guidance? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Most of us doubt guidance when it seems too good to be true. Should we 
try and additionally vet guidance or does guidance have the final word? Well, it's guidance has its say. Uh, and its say is usually specific and direct uh, and benevolent. Uh, and then we find ourselves waiting for what I want to call um, oh, I, I'm I'm at a loss for words. You don't, uh, don't worry about remembering that word. I think leaving us with guidance being specific, direct, and um, benevolent oh. <laughs> is for some reason, I feel like this is a, this is a page directly to have your book for me to be able to be with you, uh, and we're at the benefit of of myself and our audience. It feels like this is all of the the ways that you show up in the world for those of us that have been reading your work, you know, since we were were quite young. Um, and direct and benevolent for sure. Uh, so I I want to say thank you. You know, my questions around the, the your creative process are always because uh, I am so inspired, astonished, and, and impressed by all the work that you put out in the world. It's just amazing. And thank you for continuing to produce. Congrats on the new book. Again, for those out there in the ether listening, the book is called Living the Artist's Way. Um, the subhead is an intuitive path to greater creativity, a six week artist's way program. Uh, Julia, I can't thank you enough for your time. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us, uh, before we wrap up today's show? It's been a treat to be with you, but I want to make sure that you get everything in there that you'd like to get. Well, I just want to say, please try it that I have found uh, people who are initially skeptical uh, and then they try writing for guidance, uh, they are often astonished. So I'm asking you, I'm inviting you to be astonished. I am very excited to be astonished. And again, thank you so much for your most recent work. And for all that you do, I look forward to you keep pumping out in the books and you'll always be a welcome guest on the show. Really, really appreciate your time. And uh, for everybody out there on the internet, um, Julia's books are impossible to miss in the world. You can't, there's not a single uh, a single one that shouldn't be in, in your library if you consider yourself an artist, a creator, a builder of any type. And Julia, thank you again so much for being a guest. Until next time from Julia and myself. Have an amazing day.